Welcome to the next episode in the Antioch's The Town That Got Lost historical journey, where we uncover the history of this once thriving copper mining town. With each episode, we will look at the various buildings and highlights from the 1914 to 35 operating period of this North Coast Coast town, and then wrapping it up with the present to see what still remains in this forgotten town. In this episode, we will focus on the Antioch's concentrator, or secondary crusher, as some people called it. So where is Antioch's? Antioch's is situated on BC's north coast at sea level, about 145 kilometers north of Prince Rupert, near the head of Observatory Inlet. It lies in a small protected bay called Granby Bay and was formerly named Goose Bay. The town is only accessible by boat or aircraft. So the concentrator was one of many projects built by Granby Consolidated 10 to 12 years after the mine had commenced. So what was the purpose of the concentrator? Simply, it was designed to take the lower grade ore and crush it into a powder where the copper and other important metals could be separated from the gang or the deleterious rock that encased it. And why was it needed? Well, the mine had high graded the best ore in the first 10 years of operation, and this ore with a higher percentage of copper could be sent directly to the smelter. It was built to treat a large reserve of greenstone, silicious, or gang ore that could not be profitably smelted directly. Essentially, intended to handle the lower grade ores from the Hidden Creek mine. Several million tons of this ore had been blocked out at the mine and stored for this later purpose in that uh, first 10 years. So construction started in April 1923 and was completed March of 1924. And the concentrator went through continual tweaking and modifications to get the most output and the highest percentage of copper concentrate possible. So where was the concentrator located? It was strategically located on the north side of Falls Creek, opposite the smelter on the hillside west of the flats area. It was located on a direct line between the smelter and the mine and on the joining railway. It was adjacent to Falls Creek where water could be easily obtained for the plant and especially the flotation ponds. And it was also just above the flats disposal area and near Falls Creek where the disposal of the tailings could go. On a side note, Granby did have a pilot concentrator that they built in 1918 that could handle 100 tons per day. And this is far less than the 6,000 tons that the new concentrator would end up handling. Uh, this pilot concentrator was built close to Falls Creek because a concentrator needs a lot of water for their flotation system. Uh, the concentrates were quite heavy and uh, they came in sacks, about 12 inches by 24 inches and would weigh about 100 pounds. And Granby learned a lot. Um, from the six years of operation of this small-scale concentrator and would use this knowledge for the future concentrator. So as mentioned before, uh, 1914 to 1924 only the high-grade ore was smelted and the lower-grade ore was stockpiled um, for when the building of the concentrator was completed. So here's a short clip from the Alice Arm and Antioch's Herald newspaper on April 4th, 1923. Um, yeah, kind of showcasing the construction uh, of the new uh, concentrator at Antioch's. So May 7th, 1923, which was a fine day in Antioch's, was the start of excavation for this new modern concentrator, which would be one of the most up-to-date in the whole entire North America. Uh, the balance of the construction and the installation of machinery were carried on throughout the winter and this new concentrating plant was opened during March of 1924. About 100 men were employed to build the mill and uh, the original capacity was, was 1,200 to 1,300 uh, tons per day but over a period of years they fine-tuned things and increased this to 6,000 tons um, per day and was considered, like I said, one of the most up-to-date uh, plants in, uh, in North America. It would run uh, 24 hours a day as well. I think it's important to discuss how the concentrator worked and how it processed the ore. So the ore was crushed to about a six inch size from the primary crusher which was up at the mine site um, and you can see the large building there. Um, so yeah about six inches inside and this all this uh, ore was put into 25 ton capacity ore cars and transported the one kilometer by rail to the concentrator. Uh, they built trestle and tracks on a high line of the railway and that came right over top of the concentrator and right over top of the ore bins. These ore bins were 2,000 ton capacity and would take these uh, 25 ton kind of ores, dump them in and uh, send them directly to a gyrating crusher of which there were two of these and they were manufactured by a company called 
trailer and uh, they were just kind of called the trailer gyrating crushers and had a 400 mesh size on them and you can see a diagram here of how the ore would come down the gyrating crusher would uh, make it smaller and smaller and then uh, it was fed onto a conveyor belt from there and fed through a grizzly grate so that uh, anything under two and a half inches was uh, directly sent to a um, to another mill anything uh, bigger than that went to the roll mill the roll mill took all this two inch ore and uh, using its 54 by 20 inch rolls with a Hummer screen um, would take this ore and feed it in between. So basically the, the roll mill had two opposing uh, rotating hard face rollers, one mounted stationary and the other under heavy uh, spring tension. The material would be ground um, between the rollers and crushed by all this, uh, this, this pressure. From there it was sent to a conveyor and went to a rod mill. Um, and this had about a 200 uh, mesh inch size and the rod mill which was similar to a ball mill Except that it uses long rods for grinding the ore down into a very very fine powder And it used this by just tumbling these rods around inside this uh, this big case and you can see on the diagram here Roughly how um, how that worked and then from there a large conveyor system um, between this crushing plant, which is now complete, uh, carried the fine ore into some steel bins uh, ready for the flotation mill. And we'll talk about that next. So the flotation process, which is similar to what's used today in mines, is a, a method of differential flotation. Um, and their process had evolved from the previous six years of research. So it's, it's kind of a process known as oil flotation. So in this process, a small quantity of oil is mixed with the ore, um, this ore that came from the fine grinding of the, of the last uh, mill, the rod mill. The oil is impregnated into the powder, diluted with water, and then is passed through a series of cells, um, which inject into the powder a large volume of low-pressure air in the form of small bubbles. The air bubbles rising to the surface carry up the valuable mineral particles to the surface and leave the worthless material uh, down to the bottom, which can then be uh, sluiced away. Um, at the end of this, the, the cell, the frothy mixture containing the valuable mineral particles is treated in these large circular settling ponds, which you can still see today, and uh, whose function there is to remove the water from the pulp. Um, they are then sent and dewatered in one of uh, two tanks, and a battery of filters further reduce the moisture content, and the comparatively dry, con dry concentrate is then ready for the smelter. It's about a 16 to 18% um, copper um, um, concentrate uh, from there that's uh, then conveyed to the, uh, the the ore cars and then uh, sent off to the smelter. So this, as mentioned before, this plant ran 24 hours a day and employed about uh, 22 men while operating. And uh, due to the uh, this new concentrate um, and less stress on the, the smelter, it allowed for only uh, three of the four furnaces for three of the four uh, smelter furnaces to be used and actually could increase uh, the amount of um, uh, blister copper per day by six or seven tons by just the introduction of this new um, concentrator. Uh, environmental standards uh, aren't what they, uh, they are today and um, you can see this even today um, when visiting the site. Um, some of the tailings were actually stored in the flats uh, below the concentrator and you can still see remnants of this with not a lot of vegetation growing and the, the, uh, the kind of the irony uh, uh, colors that, that still remain. And here's a, a copy or a, uh, of an article in the newspaper that uh, mentions this um, where they would be sent. And later on, um, as mentioned before, that uh, they wanted to have a, a good flow of, uh, of water and uh, have this concentrator located near Falls Creek, they actually uh, mention um, sending a bunch of the tailings down into the, uh, the creek near the ocean and thinking this is a very satisfactory method of disposing of all the, uh, the tailings. And you can see um, some evidence of this, uh, some other incidents that happened later on where just the, the cyanide toxicity of, of Falls Creek um, yeah, it wasn't a very good situation and actually uh, kept one young boy from being rescued um, as he'd fallen into the creek uh, later on. So, um, yeah, now that the, the concentrates from the mill, they were treated at the smelter. It wasn't uh, as, as necessary to use as much quartz flux um, as well in the smelter. So that was another added benefit of the uh, of the smelter. And as mentioned, it was about uh, five to six hundred thousand dollars invested in this uh, concentrator and which is one of the many projects 
that uh, were needed at that time as uh, it did uh, require a lot of new power which then um, required a new uh, power source and a new dam and so yeah it was uh, a period of lots of uh, construction um, around this 1923-24 period in Antioch. So I mentioned one of the issues with the uh, toxic cyanide in Falls Creek was uh, a young boy Wilfred Chettleton Tebow who actually was playing near the Falls Creek and throwing rocks in and accidentally fell in um, and the water was uh, yeah so toxic that his brother Art attempted to save him but the men had to hold him back as he would have succumbed to the uh, toxicity if he'd gone in to uh, to rescue his young his young brother and you can still see uh, um, his uh, gravesite or gravestone in the the cemetery cemetery today um, it was also a dangerous place to work this is another article a uh, young man Alexander Bretson fell into one of the ore bins and was smothered um by the ore as another uh, load was dumped on top of them so yeah wasn't a uh, a good place to work either but um yeah let's have a look now and see what uh see what remains of the uh the massive concentrator today the concentrator is still a massive building but only a fraction of what it used to be and this is due to much of the steel um, has been cut and shipped out after it closed in 1935 but uh, even then, it's still an impressive building. Uh, when you get up close, it's it's essentially a tangled mess of steel and broken concrete and a major safety hazard to investigate uh, any further. Uh, the new road to the dam actually goes right in front of the concentrator so you can get up close and uh, have a good look at uh, what still remains. Uh, looking down below the road, you'll see remnants of the poison meadow or the flats um, where almost nothing grows due to the tailings being deposited there for a period of time and still has that uh, irony, uh, orangey uh, glow to it. Uh, the flotation ponds towards the creek still remain are, and are full of a green sludgy concoction. And uh, yeah, inside the, uh, the building, a uh, few of the famous stolen stenciled light bulbs have been retrieved. I know that um, from the past, deep inside the concentrator structure. Um, and who knows what, uh, what still remains in there, but uh, definitely a safety hazard uh, getting in there. So that's essentially what, uh, what's left of the, of the building today. So thank you for watching and if you like this episode, keep watching past episodes and future ones. And as always, if you're interested in visiting this remote ghost town, please contact me to see how you can be one of the few people each year to be taken back in time.